uh, this afternoon technology driven facilitation my name is Ituto Olado Tunike Olon to Sinham the Ituto for NSC 310 basic medic just a continuation of basic medical surgical nursing one which was discussed during the first semester uh, in which we discussed medical cases. But this time around, we'll be going through the uh, post-operative management of patients, or post-op and uh, management of patients, not of such patients. So, We'll quickly go through the hotline. During our face-to-face, -face, uh, during our online presentation, we discuss through those study sessions discussed, so that we we'll remind ourselves of what we discuss during our phase. Concepts of pain, management of pain, diagnostics, investigations of medical surgical conditions, laboratory investigation, clinical observation. Collection of specimen, preoperative intervention, nursing intervention for post-operative patients, post-operative nursing care. So that's what we're going to do. And we'll start with patients that come in at all the patients we have in post-operative world at one time or the other, go through, go through pain. This major concept and be able to administer care to our patient. So by the way of introduction, pain can be described as psychological experience of events occurring within the patient. Start all over again. Uh, I said at the beginning that this is a technology driven facilitation, and this is NSC 310 Basic Medical Surgical Nursing 2. I am Ola Dot Tunike, I'm the e tutor for this course. We, um, this, I discussed this course with us during our online facilitation. And during the online facilitation, we're able to discuss 10 study sessions. We, go, we went through 10 study sessions, and this afternoon, again, we'll revise these 10 study sessions. So by the way of introduction, we have our hotline, which is concept of pain, management of pain, diagnostic investigation of medical surgical conditions, laboratory investigation, clinical observation, collection, uh, uh, collection of specimen, preoperative intervention, nursing intervention for post-operative patients and post-operative nursing care. So these are my, these topics are what we are going to be looking at this afternoon. And even though, although we have discussed it before, but we will still look at it again. So by the way of introduction, I said it earlier on that for our post-operative patients, they usually have pain because of the surgical procedure they went through, they go through. So we as nurses we need to understand these concepts called pain so that we'll be able to deliver nursing care to our patients effectively and efficiently so pain can be described as psychological experience of
Okay. So hello everyone. Good afternoon everyone. I hope you are hearing me. Yes, we can hear you now. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. We'll start. We'll start all over again. Uh, as we have said that this is a technology driven facilitation and we have talked about the hotlines that we mentioned the
Hello, sir. Hello. Hello everyone once again. I hope you are all hearing me now. I'm Olado to Nike Olorun Tosin. I'm sorry about the itches once again. Uh, we have talked about the hotline for the course for what we'll be discussing this afternoon. And quickly we'll run through the concept of pain, which is the introduction, the concept of pain. So we'll quickly discuss pain, because every of our post-operative patients goes through this at one time or the other due to the surgical incision and the surgical procedure done. Pain can be described as a psychological experience of events occurring within the patient's body always unpleasant and often associated with the impression of damage to the tissue. And like I said the other time, that pain is subjective response to both physical and psychological stressor. So we want to look at classification of pain. So we have acute pain and chronic pain. Acute pain is usually temporary. It has a sudden onset and is localized. It is the pain that lasts for less than six months and has an identifiable cause. Mr. G Hello? You can continue. Okay. Um, like she as she was um saying, other types of pain. Um, pain may originate in the skin, subcutaneous tissue, muscles, bone, or in any organ of the body. That is, you can have this pain occurring in any part of the body. It could be the tissue, muscles, bone, and um referred pain now. Is the pain that is perceived in an area in an area distance from the site of the stimuli. It seems to occur most often with damage or injury to viscera. When you talk of referred pain, now we're looking talking about a pain that is occurring in a different place. Probably you have a chest pain now, and it's you are you're feeling it just at your back. That is what we call referred pain. Some patients, when they are complaining of angina, they tell you they are having pain in their shoulder. That is what we call referred pain. It's occurring at a different area to where the pain is felt. Then psychogenic pain now is experienced in an absence of any diagnostic physiologic event or cause. That is, it doesn't have a particular 
reason for the pain. It is not physiologic. There is nothing that has caused this pain. It's just psychogenic. It's just an experience of pain. And phantom limb is a confusing pain, um, a confusing pain syndrome that occur following surgical or traumatic amputation. Like we have with uh, patients with, with um, um, amputated limb now, they complain of phantom pain. As if the, the limb is still there and it's causing pain, that's phantom pain. And then um, neurologic pain now, like the neuralgias, are painful conditions that result from damage to a peripheral nerve caused by infection or disease. These ones are most of the pain you, um, patients with uh, diabetic foot feel. Then superficial somatic. This refers to pain in the body structures such as the skin or subcutaneous tissue, the pain that, has, that are peripheral in nature. That's uh, the superficial pain. Now we'll be talking about the physiology of pain. Stimuli causing pain may be chemical, thermal, electrical, or mechanical. That is, something must have caused this pain. Maybe chemical, maybe thermal, when you, when you move to something hot, electrical, maybe electrocution, or mechanical in origin. When you feel a pain due to, due to accidents, then now receptors respond to stimuli and transmit the impulse by two types of fibers. You know, the, the nerve receptors at the ganglion, once you feel the pain, they transmit it for you to be able to understand that pain. That is, fast myelinated A delta fibers and slow or myelinated C fibers to the posterior horn of the great, uh, the gray matter now of the spinal cord. You know, the, the pain pathway now. That's what this is trying to explain to you. Within the cord, the impulses are transmitted to the white matter on the opposite side from which they are sent to the lateral spinothalamic tract of the hypothalamus, thus explaining the pain pathway further. Next slide, please. So when this happens, impulses are then sent to the, the cerebral cortex where perception takes place by the way of corticothalamic tract. The descending pain pathway from the brain are two types. You know, um, in, the, in the pain um, pathway now, the, the stimulus, the, the way you feel it, have two types um, of it in the brain. The first pathway, which is the one that descends from the brainstem, the reticular formation, and ends in the posterior horn of the spinal cord. And uh, the second pathway send the signal from the cortex through the spinal cord to the muscles to initiate an action in that place where you feel the pain, you know? Um, factors influencing pain response now. You have anxiety. When you are anxious, you feel pain in a different way. When you are anxious, there is this agitation in you that makes you feel painful stimuli. Our culture, some rays have this pain tolerance more than the other. Our culture, our belief, give us some pain tolerance more than another. Then um, the theory of pain transmission now. What are those theories? that are understood to pain transmission. The most commonly accepted theory is the gate control theory proposed by Melzack and Wall. This theory is in your manual. I will encourage you to go through it and understand it better. Then um, the theory suggests that transmission of pain impulse can be controlled by gating mechanism. Next slide, please. So, pain management. 
as nurses, it is paramount for us to understand pain management. Because if we don't understand the concept of pain management, then we will not be able to understand our patients and be able to administer care onto them. The goal of pain management is to decrease pain and improve pain, patient functional status. Using the nursing process approach, pain includes, I mean, assessment of the pain. This will involve both subjective and objective data. This, when you see a patient complaining of pain, you have to give an assessment. I mean, take an assessment of the patient. Subjective data and the objective one. Subjective one are the ones you see, and the objective one are the one. I mean, subjective one are the one the patient complain about, and the objective one are the one you are able to, you know, evaluate. The subjective one, This is this include pain intensity. You will ask the patient to describe how they feel the pain. You can tell them on a scale of one to ten. Can you describe how you feel the pain? One being the least, and um, ten being the highest. So you can at least have an idea of what the patient is talking about. And um, once you are able to get this, you can record and um, it will serve as a baseline data for you. Also, you ask the patient for the timing, the location, the quality, personal meaning, the aggravating factor, and the elevating factor. Here you are trying to be assertive of what is happening to the patient. Okay, madam, you are complaining of chest pain when does it start what do you do that makes it worse all of these questions are questions you will ask that help you to get the subjective data now going by the objective data assist the objective data assist the nurse in identifying possible pain and discomfort in the patient behavioral manifestation of pain must be watched out for that is when you are observing the patient you look at the patient and just take your observation of how the patient reacts to the pain they, they complain of. This includes holding the body um, rigid, moving restlessly, frowning, gritting of the teeth, clenching fists, crying or moaning. You know, when we mentioned that there are um, different ways of tolerating pain, you you'll be able to note the objective one in your patient. Then um, nursing diagnosis. Possible nursing diagnosis include ineffective breathing pattern related to pain in the chest or abdomen, anxiety related to increasing pain, self-care deficit related to pain, and um, sexual dysfunction related to pain. You know, you can base your nursing diagnosis on this um, stated diagnosis based on patient complaints. The objective and the subjective data you have gotten will help you to reach a diagnosis of which all thing is the patient's problem and which or where do you relate the pain to. Sexual dysfunction is the patient having, depending on the complaint of the patient, will guide you to reach a diagnosis of what the patient is feeling the pain on. Next slide, please. Expected patient outcome. Um, the patient states that um, comfort is improved. That is, when you are planning your care for the patient, what you expect the patient to, to do. Um, what, what you expect the patient to do or what the expectation of the patient um, there, you should be able to state that expected patient outcome. And then um, once you state the outcome, what you anticipate after your intervention, then you now give your nursing intervention. Anticipate and prevent painful stimulus. How do you want to anticipate and prevent painful stimulus? You, from your history taking, from your subjective and objective data, you as a nurse will have been able to establish what are those things that have causing the pain to the patient, and by doing, you will have anticipated the ways to prevent this painful stimuli. Then, decrease pain stimulus. How do you want to decrease, decrease pain stimulus? By giving nursing care, you want to provide comfort. 
if patient is having a headache, your nursing care could be that you have a bowl of water with a flannel. You, in, you can dip the, the flannel in water and um, in a tepid water and just apply on the forehead. This could bring a kind of comfort to the patient. By so not doing, you are decreasing the pain stimulus. Then relieve pain source. Once you have been able to establish where the source of the pain, you can provide comfort, probably by elevation. If it is a swelling that is causing the pain, if you, are, you, if you elevate, then you know that the source of the pain will reduce and patients will feel some comfort. So all of these are just the intervention that you can give. And after your intervention, you should be able to assess the effectiveness of the intervention to determine whether the intervention should be continued, modified, or discontinued. That is the essence of evaluation. When you evaluate the care you are given, you will go back if you need to modify, or if you need to continue or discontinue this care, evaluation will guide you aright. Then, non-traditional pain treatment. What are those things we do that are not um, traditional, but at least it helps to relieve pain? Transcutaneous nerve stimulation. You know, this attempt to block the pain pathway when you do a transcutaneous nerve stimulation, when you stimulate the nerve around the, the place where the patient complains, this can help to relieve pain. Then um, acupuncture is another procedure that is done to elevate patient pain. Then diagnostic investigations now. Endoscopy is a medical instrument used to visualize the examination of the interior of a body cavity or a hollow organ such as the colon, bladder, and stomach. You know, these are procedures that can be done to, to determine what the cause of pain is in patients, and endoscopy is one. To use to visualize the hollow cavities or organ now that is not visible to the um, eye. Then, different types, depending on the aspect of body being visualized, there are different types of endoscopy, depending on where you want to actually visualize in the patient. Then, the other one is um, um, this endoscopy you have the, the gastroscopy visualization of the. Um, um, the um, Mucosa of the stomach, anoscopy visualization of the mucosa of the anus, protoscopy visualization of the mucosa of the rectum, and sigmoidoscopy, which is that of the sigmoid colon. As the procedure, the one you are targeting is by which the name goes. Then general um, nursing responsibility. Now, what are those general nursing responsibility to do before the procedure? As you have to explain the procedure to the patient, you know. It is paramount for us as nurses to get our patient consent before any procedure. And in the way of gaining consent, we have to explain the procedure to the patient and ensure the patient understands the procedure. Then you get a written permission from the patient. That is a uh, consent now for the procedure to be undertaken. Make sure the patient signed an informed consent. Then patients will be on nail per aura for six to eight hours prior to the procedure to prevent the regurgitation. Then remove eyeglasses, dentures, all um, um, dressings, artificial um, nails, I mean, artificial dressings, teeth, dentures, earrings, and other things that can um, interfere with the procedure. So what are those specific responsibilities for anoscopy, protoscopy, and Hello. Thank you. Okay. As we are continuing on the, 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 the things you have to do before the procedure, you give sedatives and atropine to, as, as ordered by the doctor to lessen apprehension and um, decrease secretion. Then after the procedure, you have to make the patient rest for one to two hours before the patient can leave the hospital. Then do not allow him or her to eat or drink until gag reflex returns to the patient. You have to ensure that patient has this reflex before they can start to eat or drink so that aspiration will not 
take place. Then observe for, um, for ex expectoration or vomiting, yeah, of blood due to perforation. You know, when this procedure is done, there is every possibility during the uh, introduction of the, the um, instrument, there is every possibility that there could be perforation. So you expect that patients could either have um, vomit or something. So you should be anticipatory of that. So specific nursing responsibility now for the, the specific procedures like the anoscopy, protoscopy, and the endoscopy. One is you have to instruct patients on low residue diet the evening before the procedure. Even though the patient would have to be on neopar aura for six to eight hours, you have to instruct them to take low residue diet even before the procedure. And also you give laxative and enemas to clean the bowel, to make sure the bowel is clean enough so that visualization can be effective. Then L position patients usually need to chest position and drape the patient adequately so that the patient will not be unduly exposed. Then another um, investigation that, that is done here is the kidney function test. In normal kidney function, the kidney has the ability to regulate the amount of water leaving the body depending on the body's need. You know, the function of the kidney is majorly to eliminate um, substances um, that are not useful in the body so that the uh, the blood can be purified for circulation when um, excretion is needed by the renal part. And the normal, um, the normal urea creatinine level is um, eight to sixteen percent creatinine, eight, oh, 0 0.8 to one point seven mil, uh, milligram percent, and the uric is um, four to Four point, I mean, five point five percent. Those are to be noted. Next slide, please. Then also part of the elimination by the the kidney is the serum albumin, the globulin, and at the normal level we have the protein, total protein to be six to eight point two milligram percent. The albumin three point eight to six point several milligram percent and the globulin to be 1.2 to 3.2 milligram percent. Please take note of those value. It's important as nurses so that when you see patients come in with results, you can interpret results. The another investigation that is paramount here is the cerebrospinal fluid. Um, if, when you're man managing patients with some the, um, the condition that cerebrospinal in nature, like the meningitis, the, you measure the cerebrospinal fluid pressure and you have to know the normal values so that you can be sure when there are variation. The normal WBC, the white blood cell in the cerebrospinal fluid should be zero to five elevated in bacteria infection. Then, the red blood cell should be zero, which indicates um, um, bleeding in CS and the cerebral uh, central nervous system is present. Then total protein, 20 to 40 milligram, increase in infection or tumor. That is, when there is infection or tumor, this will increase more than what you have. The RBC, you should not have anything, but if you have bleeding, it indicates there is a bleeding in the CNS, the central nervous system now. And glucose, you should have 60 to 80 milligram per deciliter of blood. That's the normal values you should have. But once you have anything beyond this value, then you know there is a problem. So what are those clinical observations that are required? General observation in, involves in assessing the patient from head to toe. This includes assessing the skin color, the attitude, and the vital sign. You want to do a general observation of the patient from head to toe, getting information that would guide you to 
give a good nursing management. If you are able to establish your baseline data, then you will have something to compare with when patients are under your care. And um, observation of physics and tool and stool. Physics are byproducts of digestion. They are composed mainly of food residue, bacteria, salt, and water. Okay. So you do the general observation of all those things so that you'll be able to establish baseline information to compare with when patients are receiving care in your facility. Next slide, please. So what are those abnormalities in the stool that we can watch out for? The stool may be black if iron medicine is being taken. A, a pale or clay colored is giving you a sign of obstructive jaundice. Gray, bulky and offensive is a sign of cellulitic disease. And um, green in babies with intestinal upset, and you can have malena stool in patients that are bleeding. You know, all of these are the ab abnormalities that are found in the stool. When you see any of this, you should be able to determine which is the patient's problem. Next slide. Unusual content of two. If feces contain bright blood, this indicates that there is a lesion or a carcinoma of the rectum. You know, um, when you see bright blood in the in the two now, this should tell you that there is a, a colorectal carcinoma. Then uh, the mucus is not normally observable in the two, but may be obvious in pelvic abscess or fecal impaction in uh, or the, um, when you have ulcerative colitis when you see mucus in the stool it should be telling you that there is an abscess either in the in the pelvic maybe the, the fecal matter is impacted somewhere or there is ulcerative colitis so you should be able to notice all these unusual things in the blood and what and in the in the stool and what they mean and pus can be present in ulcerative colitis too when the when the, the colon have been um eroded there is, there is every possibility that it could bring out pus that is for the the colon and the rectum now for the chest observation of cough a cough is a reflex act whose primary function is to protect the airway from entry of foreign materials. It could be dry or productive. You know, when you cough, it is normal. When you, feel an, when you feel an irritant, the first thing the body does naturally is that you cough. It is just a primary function of the airway to protect it from foreign materials. And um, what are those causes of those things that could cause coughing. Inflammation of the larynx or trachea, the presence of secretion in the airway, pressure on the trachea or bronchi, all of these can cause coughing. When you have anything irritating the airway, now the larynx, the trachea, you can have cough and um, any secretion. Once you have secretion, pressure, the first reaction is that there is this cough reflex that is geared up. Next slide, please. The point to be noted in connection with coughing, when a patient is coughing, what are those things that you should observe? The first one is the time at which it occurs, the length of attack, presence of cyanosis, presence or absence of pain and the nature of the sputum. It is important as nurses that when our patient complains of cough, you should be able to know the time at which the cough occurs. Is it more during the day? Is it more at night? What is the length of this coughing? Is this just intermittent cough or 
a deep cough that patient coughs continually for five to ten minutes. Then when patients cough, is there signs of cyanosis because the patient go blue when they are coughing, which will tell you there is obstruction in the lungs already. Then is there presence of pain? When the patient is coughing, do they feel pain? And where is the pain even when they feel the pain? Then the nature of sputum they bring out, you should be able to know the nature of the sputum the patient brings out. Is it bloody? Is it mucopurulent? Is it um, clean sputum? Some will just bring out saliva and tell you it's sputum. So you should be able to know the nature of this sputum that patient brings out. Next slide. Then observation of the sputum include the amount, the viscosity, the odor, the presence of any material of blood, just like I've mentioned earlier. You have to note if the sputum is mucopurulent, if there is any substance of blood in it. All of these had indication. When you see blood in the sputum, you want to query if the patient has ruptured a vein in the, the respiratory pathway, or there is um, a kind of condition, maybe TB or something. If it's mucopurulent, you know there is a serious infection. The viscosity and amount too should be noted when patient brings out sputum. Next slide. So collection of sputum now. How do we collect sputum? I mean, sorry. Collection of specimen. Now, you know, as nurses, we are the ones that collect specimen so that the uh, specimen can be investigated and a good diagnosis can be reached. The first one is urine specimen collection. Types of urine specimen. You have what specimen, clean specimen, catheter specimen, and four hourly specimen. The normal word specimen are the routine collection of um, urine for investigation in the world. Then um, another sample that are usually collected are the TU specimen, uh, the Bowsby, which means the removal of TU from part of the body for examination. It could be the liver, the bone marrow, Bowsby, depending on the site of collection, which will be pertaining to the patient's complaint so that it can be investigated what the cause of the problem is and what are the nurse's responsibility in fixation of a bowel specimen. Any tissue given to the nurse should be carefully preserved. When a bowel is collected, it's usually kept in the designated sample port too, which will then be transferred to the laboratory for investigation. As quickly as possible, puff fixative liquid over the specimen. Then we label the name of the patient, the hospital number, the type of specimen, that is, is it the liver palsina or the bone marrow palsy um, specimen. Then you fill out a slip that will follow the specimen to the lab and ensure that the specimen is delivered straight to the lab for further investigation. Pre-operative intervention now. What are those things that we do pre-operatively for patients? Surgeries may be classified into several ways by which the location surgery may be performed externally or internally. The extent of the surgery may be classified as minor or major. And the purpose of the surgery could be for diagnostic, for curative, for restorative, palliative, or cosmetic surgery. Location of the surgery, you know, we're talking about if it is just an external opening or the internal one. You know, all of this are important and they are the classification of surgery. So what are those phases of perioperative period now? The surgical experience can be classified into three stages. The preoperative phase, that is before the patient 
goes in for surgery, what are those things you do for the patient? Those are the preoperative phase. Then the intraoperative phase during the surgery, what are those nursing responsibilities that are expected of us as nurses? And postoperative period and after the surgery now, what are those things that are done or are required? Those are the phases of operative periods. Um, next slide. Now, the preoperative assessment. Preoperatively, you have to assess patients by the way of data collection. You collect data before patients go in for surgery to identify the patient's knowledge of the event that will occur. Remember when we were talking earlier, we said that patients should be informed of the procedure. So you want to ensure preoperatively again that patient is actually aware of what is about to be done for them. Patients should be carried along. All information should be given to them pertaining to the expectation of the procedure. Then physiological readiness for the surgery. You have to evaluate the patient. Once you are able to um, assess if patient has the knowledge of the procedure, you also have to assess if the patient is psychologically ready by asking them pertinent questions about the procedure. For example, if a patient is going for a cesarean section, you know, a cesarean section is a surgery that, of course, is going to bring about a birth of a child. So the patient who is pregnant and knows he or she is going for a cesarean section should know the prones and crones of the procedure. That is the knowledge. And psychological readiness. When you ask questions, you, you assess patients if they are ready. Madam, you're going for a surgery. Are you prepared? Will you be glad to feel the pain that will come after the procedure? You know, all of this will help you to evaluate if the patient is psychologically ready. Then the physiologic status before surgery. The physiologic status now is the pre operative investigations and other um, necessary investigation, ablation investigation like the, the um, um, hemoglobin level, the um, vital signs, and all of these are the, those physiologic um, status you check before procedure. Then possible nursing diagnosis might include the following. Anxiety related to unknown prognosis, fear of death, deficient knowledge, disturbed sleeping pattern. All of these are nursing diagnoses that could be related to a surgical procedure. Next slide. The intervention now. Before a patient goes to, for any surgical procedure, you must ensure that this patient is on NIPA aura for at least six to eight hours before the procedure. You want to do this so that you want to prevent um, possibility of aspiration regurgitation during procedure. Then patients will likely need to be there one to two hours prior to the surgery, to, um, prior to the scheduled procedure. So you encourage patients to come in before the procedure so that patient will be relaxed, calm before the procedure. Then medications such as sedative and hypnotics can be given preoperatively. For example, Valium can be given preoperatively to calm patients down, you know, to, to allay their anxiety before a surgery. Then preoperative teaching, part of the preoperative teaching is um, the deep breathing exercise, the coughing exercise, the leg exercise, ambulation, and all of this, you know, because once a patient goes in for surgery, any type of surgery the patient is going in for, you should teach patient preoperatively so that you will reduce the possibility of a complication. The patient that is undergoing surgery, you have to let the patient understand how to deep breathe while they are on um, hospital bed. You know, immobility can cause various complications. So you teach patients deep breathing, you teach them about coughing exercise, 
teach them about leg exercise, how they can um, move the legs while on the hospital bed. All of this will help to prevent complications that could come out, out of um, immobility. Then you teach them how they would ambulate post-operatively. You know, patients that are operated upon will not be able to resume back to normal life immediately just like that. So preoperatively, you have given patients teaching on how they would adjust post-operatively. That is what all of this is telling us about preoperative teaching. Then the diagnostic procedures that that will be done for the patient. Um, you have to take samples for the hemoglobin level and um, other um, relevant diagnostic procedures before the surgery, depending on the kind of surgery patient is going in for. You know, there are some investigations that are pertinent to specific procedures. If the patient is going for um, Myometomy, you know, you must be able to get the hemoglobin level and other um, pertinent condition because, you know, myometomy patients bleed a lot. So you don't want to take chances. You don't want to take an anemic patient to the, lab, to the theater and get stuck on the way. All of this you should ensure is done. Then preoperative skin preparation, depending on where the surgery will be taking place. Shaving the area, cleaning preoperatively, and um, all of this should be done before the surgery. All personal belongings are identified and secured. Patients belonging, you put their names and have a secured cupboard so that there won't be any um, loss of personal belonging while patient is in the surgical room. Jewelry's dentures are removed so that they, they, they don't dislodge, especially if the patient is undergoing um, oral surgery. You, know, you remove dentures so that this don't get dislodged during surgery. And um, jewelry's too are removed. Patient just goes in naturally so that there won't be any fear of unanticipated event. Next slide. Post-operative nursing care. After the surgery, what are those things we do? You do your post-operative assessment, which includes systematic assessment of the patient. You want to assess the respiratory function now, because that is paramount. Patient's respiratory rate, we want to know if the breathing is normal, if it's shallow, if it's deep, how many cycles per minute. You have to assess that. The cardiovascular function, you check the blood pressure, the pulse rates. You check um, the circulation of um, oxygen saturation. All of those you check, then Neurological and sensory function. You want to check if patient is conscious, if they feel pain, and um, all of this are just important for you to check post-operatively, so that you will know if patients are deteriorating, and you can quickly signal to the uh, managing physician to come in as at when due. One when necessary, then fluid and electrolyte balance. It is important postoperatively to ensure that patients get adequate fluid because most times these patients before surgery are on new per hour for about six to eight hours, and postoperatively, even intraoperatively, they have lost fluid and electrolyte through blood. So, you should ensure we are you're replacing the fluid and electrolyte as at necessary to the patient post-operatively should be able to um, assess patients intermittently. Usually when patient comes out of surgery, you do your vital signs every um, 30 minutes, every 15 minutes for about an hour, and every 30 minutes, depending on patient's condition. That will determine how often you do your 
vitals on the patient and you record every assessment. Documentation is essential in nursing care. Ensure take assessment and document as observed. Next slide. So nursing care during post-operative stage now. All that monitoring is required. Just like I've mentioned, you have to be monitoring this patient often depending on the patient's condition. Patient's condition will tell you if you need to maintain your 15 minutes vitals and how long you have to maintain it. Then as the patient improves, you, you give more timing to the vital monitoring. A level of consciousness you should be able to record the patient's level of consciousness with the, the Glasgow Coma Scale level of measurement. You should be able to assess how conscious this patient is. It is important so that when patient is deteriorating, you you will know on time and you can intervene. Then positioning, you should know the type of procedure the patient has gone for, this would guide your positioning of the patient. The type of procedure would guide positioning of the patient. So patient should be placed the right position for his or her surgery. Then maintenance of respiration. You have to ensure that the airway is patent so that there won't be any obstruction to respiration. Usually patient is head is turned to side so that there won't be falling back of the tongue that would obstruct respiration or probably aspiration. Next slide, please. Then removal of secretions. When patients have a lot of secretions, one thing we do as nurses is functioning. You have to remove secretions as often as possible so that patients will not aspirate the secretions. Then um, adequate ventilation, you should ensure that patients have adequate ventilation. Patients need support or ventilation. This will be done by way of oxygen therapy. So you should be able to assess patient saturation of oxygen so that you will know if patient needs assistant, um, assisted ventilation or not. The breathing exercise, as soon as patient is conscious enough to do this, you have to initiate this as early as possible once the patient is conscious. But as you encourage the patient to deep breathe. Take a deep breath in and release slowly. Take deep breath in and release slowly. This will en encourage lung expansion and um, those preventing complications that could arise from immobility. Then maintaining circulation. You have to ensure patients lie down in the correct um, postural position so that circulation can be maintained. Depending on the type of surgery, again, you ensure that the, the, um, the dressings are not too tight, the clothings are not occluding circulation, and um, you prevent further injury to the patient. Ensuring patients are well supported on the bed, and um, if need be, you support patients and um, turn if patient is conscious, so that there won't be post-operative injury to the patient. You have as nurses, you have to alleviate patient suffering and promote health. Next slide. So expected patient outcomes now. What are those things we expect when we give intervention? No injury occurred during hospitalization. When we give all of our cares adequately, then we are, patients should not sustain any injury while on hospital admission. Patients should not sustain injury. Anything patient does not come in with, is not expected to come up as an injury while patient is in our care. The incision heals normally without infection. With good nursing intervention, surgical incision are expected to heal normally without infection. 
That is why it is important to maintain aesthetic management of wounds while patient is in our care and giving of good nutrients, all of this will help us to ensure that patients have good natural wound healing. There are no avoidable complications. We well, have to ensure that complication doesn't arise, and that is why we we'll talk about the breathing exercise, the leg exercise, all of this we mentioned earlier to ensure that complication doesn't come in as a result of patient hospitalization. Then elimination patterns are re-established for patients that have gone undergone um, surgery maybe uh, abdominal surgery or related surgery, you should ensure that patients have elimination pattern being restored back by way of um, passing flatulence, being able to pass toll, and um, during, in case you, give, you, you pass the urethral catheter before surgery, then after surgery, the urethral catheter is removed and patient is able to Pass urine on their own, you know, all of this elimination pattern should be re established post operatively. Then the, the person carries out activity of daily living at optimal level. You know, when patients are in our care, most especially post operative and um, operative patients, there is limitation to activities of daily living as a result of the procedure that. Have been performed on them. So, our target is that after the procedure, post operatively, patients should be able to return back to their normal life by carrying out their daily activities of living optimally without help. Without help. This will tell us that yes, the patient has been able to, uh, has received adequate care and ready for discharge when they are able to perform activity of daily living without assistance. Next slide. So what are the possible post-operative complications now? Obstruction of airway is a complication that is commonly arising from post-operative patients. The hairway can be obstructed by vomitus or reflux of stomach content and mucus secreted in response to anesthesia and instrumentation. That is why we say that the patient preoperatively should be on nail per oral for about six to eight hours prior to surgery so that um, they, they'll be reduced um, possibility of complication that could arise from that. Once there is nothing much in the stomach, then the possibility of a reflux or aspiration of stomach content will be reduced. But that is, also, is a possible complication that can arise from um, operative procedure. The use of anesthesia causes increased secretion of mucus and um, some instrumentation that are used in performing the surgery. So the management now, the artificial hairway should not be removed until the patient is making movement of the tongue and lips to reject it. For patients that undergoes um, surgery that affects the hairway and um, artificial hairway is used, you should ensure that this remains there until the patient try to remove it by themselves, either by the use of tongue or becoming restless, you know that this patient doesn't want it again. That is when you can remove them. Otherwise, when patient is not conscious, there could be falling back of the tongue, which will cause obstruction. Next slide. If the hairway is out and the patient's lying and on the back, the relaxed tongue may obstruct, just like I mentioned. When the patient's um, tongue uh, um, falls back, it can obstruct the hairway, and this can cause a fatal complication to the patient. And this can be prevented by keeping the patient on the side, like I mentioned earlier, at least 
keeping the head turned to one side. This I have mentioned also, just to prevent complication in the patient. But once the tongue falls back, this will obstruct respiratory respiration and it can be fatal to the patient. Next slide. Next slide, please. Another complication that can arise is nausea and vomiting. As cause of postoperative vomiting are anesthetic agents, abdominal distension, pain, electrolyte imbalance, and drug idiosyncrasies. You know, some, some drugs, when you give, like some patient reacts to um, the painkiller for twin. They tend to vomit when you give for twin, it, 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 an energetic agent. So this makes vomiting eminent in those patients. And again, when patients have abdominal distension, nausea and vomiting is possible. When patients have severe pain, some of them vomit when they have severe pain. And when the electrolyte imbalance comes up in patients, the sign um, and symptom the patient will first show is they tell you they feel nauseated and most of them will even vomit. And reaction to some drugs too causes patients to have nausea and vomiting. So how do you prevent this? Next slide. Nursing intervention. Sideline position to prevent aspiration. That is important. That is important. No food or fluid within, I mean, until patient, uh, until vomiting subsides. When patient tells you they feel nausea or they are vomiting, you don't give anything per aura. The patients are to go on nail per aura until the um, sensation of vomiting subsides. Then, sips of fluid, hot tea or crackers, dry. Um, food after vomiting subside will be the first thing that will be introduced to the patient. And it will be in sieves. You don't just allow patients to take volumes. Then frequent oral care is essential to prevent nausea and vomiting. When there is clean vocal cavity, then there is less irritation. Then um, another thing is described anti-emetic may be given to the patient if the nausea and vomiting is persistent then antiemetic can be given to patient to relieve the symptoms next slide next slide please post operative shock as another complication that can arise in patients Shock is a condition of which the underlying pathology is a fall in blood pressure. That is, when the patient has a fall in blood pressure, they go into shock and um, it, is, it can be severe. It can be severe. So the possible cause of postoperative shock now, reaction to drug or anesthesia can cause shock. Loss of blood or body fluid, cardiac arrhythmias. Cardiac arrhythmia are just um, irregularity in the rhythm of the heart. When patient has irregularity in the rhythm of the heart, it can go into shock. When patient has heart failure, it can go into shock. And inadequate ventilation. When patient is not having adequate ventilation, that's why I say we should ensure that the tongue does not fall back to block airway so that shock too can be prevented in the patient. Because once the patient goes into shock and is not identified on time, it can be fatal. Next slide. The classical treatment of shock includes rest, relief of pain, fluid, oxygen. The first thing you give is you allow patient to rest by elevating the feet of the bed so that blood can circulate to the vital organs. You relieve patient pain if pain is the cause of patient's symptom. Then you give fluid in case patient is losing 
fluid and electrolyte, and it gives oxygen depending on what the cause of identify cause of the shock. Then if there is hemorrhage, then another another classical complication is hemorrhage. Hemorrhage may be internal or external, and it can be classified to the vessels from which it is taking place, if it is arteria, venous, or capillary. When the patient is bleeding, where the bleeding is coming from is where, how you classify this bleeding. <clears throat> Next slide, please. And um, it can also be classified based on the time of the when of the time when the bleeding occurs. You can have primary hemorrhage, reactionary hemorrhage, and secondary hemorrhage. Primary hemorrhage is the bleeding that continues even postoperatively. When patient after surgery, patient sees um, the clotting is not just taking place. The reactionary bleeding um, or hemorrhage is as a result of a reaction taking place or secondary bleeding if the bleeding starts after 24 hours of the surgery. The management, now do you manage the hemorrhage? Regular observation of vital signs is important. For every patient, it is just important to monitor vital signs regularly. And it is more essential in post-operative patients because those are the vital signs that will tell you if patient is deteriorating and to alert you as to when to turn. You have to observe patient's color. When patients are bleeding, patient becomes pale. So you have to observe patient's color. Also, a progressive deterioration in this, however small, should, be sus should suspect hemorrhage and inform the surgeon. When you see that patient is deteriorating, you should suspect that probably patient is bleeding from somewhere and you should alert the surgeon immediately so that interventions can be given as soon as possible to the patient. Thank you for listening. Um, time for contribution and questions from Mrs. Oladotu now. Contribution. Can you ask your question now, Shekaba? Yes, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Hello. You can talk now. I am with you. All right, sir. All you right, sir. sir. Um, uh, my question is on the Sputum, sir. He, the presenter, she actually listed some features that. Uh, we want that is the abnormal feature that can be seen in the sputum. So I want to know the significance in checking the or considering the viscosity of the sputum, sir. And then too, also you talk about uh, distension Hello? when you start listening. Yes, ready. Sir? Hello, sir. You ready? Hello? Are you done with your question? Yes. Then the one of it, one of the questions, sir, on the complications of the post host patient on the uh, distension, abdominal distension, sir, I want to know the primary uh, intervention in the patient that post op is having uh, abdominal distension, sir. That's all. Okay. The two facilitators, please respond to the question. Your first question, you're asking about Sputum. Hello. You are right. Yes, the, you want to when you are assessing patients, you want to be sure of the 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 viscosity of the sputum. When patient brings out sputum, this sputum can indicate or give signal to different diagnoses. A sputum with blood will tell you that is hello
Like I was saying, a sputum of blood will tell you, a sputum of blood will tell you patient is bleeding from the um, either respiratory tract now or the vocal, uh, vocal cavity. Because sputum are um, from the, the throat. So when there is any bleeding in that pathway, you would see it in the sputum that is being produced. If the sputum is mucopurulent, it is telling you there is an infection somewhere in the lungs. So you must be able to identify, you should be able to observe the sputum. Mm -hmm. Are you buying me your question? The patient is bleeding internally. So you check the pulse regularly, you check the vital signs regularly to be sure that the the Your question, Jude. 